Hi, Mike. How are you doing? Good. How are you doing, Steve? I'm doing good. Thanks to you. <laughs> so for folks, this is Mike Norton. Uh, he's my coach. And I met, I met Mike at uh, the local bike shop back in, uh, I think it was February 2020. And uh, Mike was there to give a little uh, lecture on uh, coaching and his style of coaching and how he coaches and kind of the state of the art of coaching. And I was very curious because I was planning to do a ride across America. And my wife kept saying, I think you better get some help. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I remember that I was very impressed with Mike. Uh, I'm a statistician. He deals with a lot of stats in nutrition. And so the, the, the science background really intrigued me. And I remember walking up to him afterwards and asking him if he ever took on projects like me, who was obviously not an Olympic athlete and he coaches world-class athletes uh, around the world. And he said, well, yeah, it depends. <laughs> and then uh, later on, we got together and he took me on as a project and I've been a benefit of his coaching. So Mike, I'd like you to tell me a little bit. You started out in uh, bike racing. How'd you get into bike racing? And uh, I'm curious that maybe uh, for you to tell me probably uh, one of your more interesting racing stories before we get into the coaching elements. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So uh, I've been in cycling for, for quite a long time. Uh, I started actually when I was nine years old. I uh, the simple fact that I had a uh, a neighbor that I thought was the the coolest guy in the world, and uh, I wanted to be just like him. And he rode bikes, so I wanted to ride bikes. And um, he actually ended up being kind of my first first informal coach, and uh, he was perfect for a nine year old because we rode bikes. He talked about kind of position on the bike. He talked about pedaling dynamics on the bike um, without even really knowing the science behind it but just form and how you how you sit on the bike and how you ride the bike um and then from there i had i had a bit of talent so uh at about 13 14 i, I really wanted to try racing my bike uh so i reached out to uh, usa cycling and got a got a racing license and everything as a kid and uh right away took to it um you know i was a, a state champion at 15 i was a regional champion at 16 i was i think fifth or sixth in the nation at, at, at 16 as well and um, continued on there and started racing international races at, at 17. Um, and then, then, then I kind of had a, um, a, a rough start. So when, when you're that good as a, as a youth athlete, uh, under 18, uh, you, you actually just start racing the elites and the pros at 18 and 19. Uh, so literally, uh, you know, the top athletes, um, like a Tyler Hamilton or Bobby Julik or, some of the guys at the time where, you know, that would now be like a Nielsen palace or, um, or even Seth Cruz that you saw when, when the tour de, uh, tour de France stage the other day, uh, you would line up next to those guys at, at 18 and, and basically you get your butt kicked. So I did that for two years and said, I need to really understand and learn more how to prepare and get ready to do these races. It's not, just, you know, being a really strong kid anymore. There's, there's science behind this and there's, there's protocol and stuff. So that actually opened the door for me in, in coaching where I was my first project. And, and that helped me, uh, within a year after kind of studying from some really high end coaches and, um, and kind of figuring out nutrition and stuff like that. Uh, I went from getting dropped in five miles, uh, out of a hundred mile race to, to meddling at nationals the following year. So I said, wow, this is really something. And, and that just kind of continued where I went on to have a professional career all around the world, mainly Europe, North America, Central America, South America. Um, and, and underlining what I learned was I really liked the training. I liked the process. I liked how you had to prepare to get ready uh, to, to do these goals. And so people kind of got word of that and uh, said, hey, will you coach me? And that's kind of how it started. <laughs> and uh had had success with those athletes right away uh and again uh even when when we met steve it, it was not really about whether you're an olympic athlete or a professional athlete uh, a weekend warrior as, as someone that races every weekend or or you want to have a big goal like like yourself where you want to ride cross country um the one element that you really need is is hard work ethic and so if you if you have that and uh, have a systematic plan in place to make sure that you train hard at the right times and recover at the right times, then, then success is going to happen and you're going to have uh, fitness improvement. But 
but yeah, you know, more than two thirds of my life has been in cycling. Um, I was really happy to do it as a professional athlete, uh, in road cycling. And then, uh, now kind of help others, uh, that I've slowed down a little bit. I can help others get faster or try to ride across, across the country. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, I know it's made a, it's made a big difference to me. Uh, and, and I remember, I, re- I remember, uh, when we, we kind of interviewed each other before we agreed and, uh, you, you wanted to make sure that I had goals. And I think I can say that, and I had a commitment to a t- time frame. And I, I think I can say uh, that I basically have those goals that I set at that time. I basically have met those goals. We're trying to push it further, but, uh, but, but in the past, when I would go on long rides, I would do touring and things like that. I would just go out and ride more all the time and I didn't really get any better. And, uh, and so uh, tell me a little bit about your, uh, your philosophy uh, in, in terms of uh, the three or four different key elements of uh, your training and then uh, how, how the science has informed us about the, the, how we focus our training versus the way I was doing it, which is riding and riding and riding and riding. Sure. Sure. Yeah. And, and um, I kind of have a little bit of a, a methodology uh, compared to others. Um, I mean, let's face it, there's a, there's a lot of uh, coaches in the world. Um, some are good and some are not so good, uh, but most of them are pretty good. They're pretty passionate. They, they want the best for their athlete. Uh, but, you know, we first encounter a, a coach, um, you know, when we're, when we're kids and we're doing, uh, you know, little league uh, baseball or something, and, and we have a coach there. And, and those coaches are really there uh, to kind of give hands-on instruction. Uh, me and my coaching style is, is a little bit more scientific, uh, where uh, I work with athletes all over the world. So I, I can't always be there once, you know, face to face. Uh, but what we do is we study statistics and analytics and we, we find patterns and models of things that work and don't work. And obviously we try to repeat the model that does work, uh, in a systematic approach, which is called periodization. And so when we do that, we have, uh, upwards of a 10 to 15% performance benefit. And so some of the underlining things before it even gets that technical is just hard work, uh, a commitment to, to the process. It is a process. It's, you know, Pete, um, someone that wants to train for like an Ironman event, you, you can't start four weeks prior to an Ironman. You know, it, it takes a minimum of a year to prepare for an Ironman and first time Ironman athletes don't really understand that. Like, Oh, well, you know, I work out at the club and I, I do runs, but, but it's, it's much more than that. It's, it's learning your body. It's, it's sleep rhythm, uh, rhythms. It's, uh, understanding nutrition and how to fuel yourself, uh, when to push, when not to push. And that's really kind of what systematic training gives you is, is kind of outlining that. And it's, you know, to get a little bit more scientific for people that are listening, it's called block periodization, which has been around for, for more than 50 years. But we, we've figured out that if we kind of drill down and work on specific metabolic energy systems, we can have the most improvement upon that and then build from it uh, to get optimal fitness. And so that, that's kind of what I do. But, you know, my, my, my three things is, you know, I guess, first off, commitment. You know, so we, uh, when, when people come and, and look to possibly hire me or work with me, uh, I, I want to get to know them first. So it's, it's not something where, you know, it's, it's not the, uh, corner store where you just walk in and, and buy, uh, buy, buy a Gatorade or, or a Coke or something. You know, it's, it's a lot more than that. It's, you know, it's first, obviously, uh, talking with the person, understanding that they're going to have to have commitment of, of probably at least a year uh, to, to see this process through, uh, hard work ethic, uh, some goals in mind. Um, and then, um, just being ready to be tested is the other thing. And so that, that takes on a couple of meetings. One, I, I always look at data or do some physiological, uh, testing, whether that's kind of uh, similar to a stress test or something, but we need to have checks and balances uh, for both of us to make sure that we're, we're both positively working together. And so some people are a little bit fearful of that, of even just getting, getting tested. Um, and so we do the physiological testing. So that's, that's a good also indication of the work ethic of the athlete and how they, how they test. Uh, and then moving forward from there, 
it's continually being tested. You know, you have a goal, you train for the goal. It becomes extremely stressful as the goal becomes closer. Am I prepared? Am I not prepared? And, and I feel my job is to eliminate all of the um, uh, worries that the, that the athlete has and just to make sure and be 100% confident that they are prepared uh, when the goal finally arises to, to, to meet it. So, so that, that's, that's pretty much how, how I look at, at coaching or, or sports science as a whole. And then when we dig a little bit deeper, you know, I, I'm a, I'm kind of a fan of threes. I think a lot of, a lot of things happen in threes. And um, I, I kind of got on this concept of a, a equally sided triangle uh, a long time ago. And, and why I like it is each, each side of the triangle has to have uh, equal uh, input. If it doesn't, the triangle is going to fall flat and it's not going to be uh, held up anymore. And that's kind of what your season's going to be uh, if you don't do the three sides. And, and those three sides are, are very basic. One is training, which honestly is the easiest out of the three. If, if I prescribe a workout protocol, the athlete goes out and does it and checks the box. Uh, when a lot of people think that's the hardest, can I do the training? Do I have time for it? And people do, uh, the other two are harder. And the next one is, is recovery. If you do not recover or what we call realize in the sport and in, in certain sports science, uh, you'll never progress. You're only going to, uh, digress because what happens in training is, is we stress the body and it's recovery when we're going to realize and get stronger from that stress. Uh, and then the glue that holds it all together that I say are the base of the triangle is nutrition. So if you're not fueling the body the right way, it's not going to react the right way. It's, it's, it's going to be, uh, in different, um, neurological systems. It's, it's, it's not going to be happy. It's not going to sleep well. It's not going to train well. So fueling and optimal nutrition is, is paramount to the, to the whole thing actually working. And I think a lot of people, underestimate that and, and nutrition is is a, is a tough uh, topic altogether. It's a, it's a very uh, lucrative industry monetarily and there's a lot of uh, opinionated uh, sides to nutrition out there when really as, as a physiologist, we look at the metabolic energy systems and what it takes to fuel those and how those chemical reactions break down and process so that we can use that energy. And that's really how we pick what micronutrients and macronutrients we need to fuel uh to perform in in whatever we want to do whether again like it's riding cross country or winning an olympic gold medal well it's interesting because since i've been doing this now you know i've experienced all that you know it's uh it's uh i've learned that you know basically i have to get eight hours of sleep to fully recover from a really hard ride and if i don't get eight hours of sleep i'm a lot more tired for the next day and for the next ride. And then that whole nutrition, I, I remember more than once you said, Steve, you gotta, you gotta learn how to eat while you're riding. Cause you know, you're riding for three or four or five hours and you're burning all these yeah. calories up and you've got to, you got to eat while you're riding. You got to practice eating while you're riding so that you, you know, you can digest that. And I've had to learn that. The other thing I've learned is it's, it's all incremental improvement. So if you just keep doing it <laughs> and listen to you, uh, yeah. you'll, you'll over time see, see the improvement. The, the other thing I have to say, you mentioned this in your talk about it's important to connect with your coach. There's, yeah. you know, and your style of coaching for me, you know, it's not just a science, but um, although I felt tested, I always felt supported. And, yeah. and I remember the first time you said, well, I'm going to have you do a, a time trial. I thought, oh my God, a time trial. <laughs> really i'm doing a time trial <laughs> well i can well can i even survive a time trial <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and basically you said oh, you're just going to go out there and you're going to do the best you can and don't worry about it and i and, and it was a really good experience i did the best i could and i didn't worry about it and it was a test because it mm -hmm. set a benchmark and mm -hmm. and i think all the way along you know you you push enough in support and push enough in support so that you make progress but you don't feel like, uh, like you want to give up because you're so burnt out, you can't accomplish anything. And that's that psychology that you provide to support me has been very helpful. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, coaching is a relationship. It's it, it's an equal partied relationship. And, and uh, both people have to be committed, including the coach. And, and so honestly, coaching, uh, it's no different from a, a high level professional athlete to the weekend warrior. I mean, I, I communicate with them uh, the same. I instruct the same. And and coaching is really all about application. And so you could be the smartest guy in the world. You could be the, the fastest woman in the world. 
uh, that doesn't always, it's not going to really relate into being a good coach. It's, it's application that makes you a good coach and, and understanding. And again, as a fan of threes, that's how I communicate. I mean, obviously your workouts are written and delivered to you uh, daily uh, through, through third-party applications online. Uh, so you know how to do that. And then also that workout is automatically with technology synced up to uh, what we call the head unit on the front of your handlebars. And, and you just follow that protocol like someone would do it, uh, for a spin class or something. So in a sense, I'm right there with you throughout the whole workout saying, okay, go hard for two minutes, go easy for two minutes mm-hmm. and, and such. Um, but the other two ways that, that are, are equally important is, is, um, you know, pretty much the weekly conversations we have to verbally communicate to each other to make sure there's understanding. There's, there's different tones and voices. I, you know, just working with an athlete was under quite a bit of stress. Um, and then they, they went through and completed a goal. And just in the meeting, I said, wow, you know, I could tell in your voice, like a, a weight's been lifted off your shoulders. You, you've completed something, you, you got through it. Uh, that stress is no longer there. So, so that verbal communication is, is, is highly, highly important. And then and then the third with, with my company is, is visualization in the sense that, you know, we have a lot of these uh, uh, workout videos and, and mm-hmm. webinars and stuff. So there's, there's a, a huge library of information that you can access where, uh, you know, if we're going to instruct you and, and I will give you a workout protocol of, of, you know, like weight training that we have in the sense that, okay, do, do you know, 10 squats, three, three sets, you know, something like that okay, I, I know a squat. I, I learned that in junior high, uh, but, but do you, and have you done a squat? So having that uh, informational video to, with tips and instructions on how to do the squat and, and that visual imagery really helps uh, on top of the verbal communication and also the yeah. kind of the written communication of the workout delivery. So I, I feel that allows me to have hundred percent compliancy in, in the application to, to the athlete, which then in turn equals success. There's no there's no guessing. I mean, my job is to really take out all the guessing and, and I do all that on, on behind the scenes there with, with the statistics yeah. and, and analytics. And those videos are very valuable because you and I have talked about this more than once and squats was one of them where I was having a knee issue, I think. And, uh, and we, I would go and review that video and then you and I would talk about what was going on. And at one time I, I did a video of myself doing a squat so you could see what was going on and we could tell where I was putting tension in the wrong place and we could correct that so that was a sure. big deal and in, in, in addition uh, you know you have lectures on nutrition that are set up in that so you can easily review those and that you don't always you can listen and not have to take the notes because the video is the notes and all that yep. so it's all very helpful yeah 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 for sure and that's yeah that's where i've kind of found my my success um with working with athletes and uh and just trying to provide as as much possible to like you said support the athlete as i can and uh and that that in turn will will equal an accomplished goal and successful goal so um yeah for sure you know so so one of course my over my really overall goal with all this was to get healthy right get really healthy and i know i I think you've got some charts maybe that i'm not too embarrassed if you want to bring us some charts (laughs) yeah let's let's (laughs) see so and show you people what what sort of you look at to judge performance and how you're improving and also you know besides I was I was telling you earlier how I felt good about a ride that I just took that I that I felt that I was recovering quicker and I was able to push harder and it was just a good ride and that was because of the of these kinds of things you're going to bring up and show yeah yeah absolutely yeah so I mean obviously um I've, I've, uh, I'm very much into the analytics. Uh, and so I, I've, over the years now I've completed over, over 300 customizable charts to kind of break down what's working, what's not working. Uh, and what's nice is you can kind of do some overlay. So when we look at, um, in general performance, uh, as we near our bigger goal that we have this chart on the, on the left here is the last seven days. And you could see with these red bars here, this is where you've had improvement, uh, just over the last week. So, when we look at um, about two minutes and then the five minute area, you've had improvement as well as, you know, the two hour area and the three plus hour area. Uh, when we follow that over to the chart on the right, uh, it's the same thing where you've had improvement over the last 30 days. And so this is kind of what we want to see with, with positive trends. So 
uh, some of the hard efforts that we've had you been doing on, on those big workouts, those 12 second things, you could see there's a red bar here where you've had improvement over the last 30 days. Uh, once again, this, this cycles again, where the, the two minute stuff we've been working on the five minute hill stuff we've been working on, uh, improvement as well as kind of the longer duration stuff. So that's really kind of cool to see where you, you put in the hard work and then you see the benefit and you're absolutely correct. You know, when we started working together, uh, you had, um, again, you know, people hear health problems and they think, Oh, were you bedridden? Did you have disease? Uh, and, it, and it's nothing, it's nothing like that. It's just that the body is an organism and it could be either optimal or not optimal. Uh, and it will always constantly try to adapt to, uh, your, your, your kind of living condition. And so if you feed it better, if you rest it better, it's going to feel better. It's going to be more energetic. Uh, it's going to react better. If you don't do that, it's going to adapt to sustain and that it can just get through the day. Uh, and, and unfortunately what happens to a lot of people is they lose sight of what it, it feels like to be optimal. And they just kind of get used to that new norm where they're slightly overweight they're stressed out. They, uh, they're not sleeping well. Um, they're, they're out of energy and they're, and they're kind of searching why, why I don't have this energy. And, and, uh, you know, the analogy I always give is if you put sand in, in, in a car engine, it's, it's not going to run. It's going to, it's going to kind of blow up. The human body is amazing that the number one goal of it is it wants to live. And so it, you put sand in the car, uh, it blows up. If you put sand in the body, it's going to figure out some way to get some sort of slight nutrients out of that to then, then function. I mean, again, it's an analogy using the sand, please, please don't go out and eat sand, but, but, uh, but it's a similar thing. And so when, when we started working together in 2020, we had you kind of test and, and this uh, left-hand side here is a chart and, and just to kind of pick out a few ones, you know, when we really kind of focused on the 20 minute power output, um, and so when we think about power output, you can think about kind of like a light bulb. Uh, and when you started uh, in 2020, uh, right away, we didn't have the power meter. So we got you a little bit of fitness utilizing heart rate. Uh, and then we finally got the power meter towards towards the middle to end of, of 2020. And um, and we did our final, we, we, you know, our best test in 2020 was 183. And where you start, it was about 150. And then in the best we got was 183. And then you fast forward to, to 2021 and now you're at over 200 in power. So that's, that's a huge improvement. Um, and I guess a year and a half, let's call it. Um, also sustainability for this, for an hour, uh, you tested at 139 and now you're at 179, uh, in that output. So uh, another way to think about this is, is kind of lifting weights. You know, when you start it, you can only lift, you know, 140 pounds and now you're lifting 180 pounds. Uh, so it's, it's, it's huge and substantial. One of the other ones that we were kind of talking about is some of this five minute stuff where before, um, you were at kind of 209 and now you're up at, uh, two, 223. So, you know, again, very impressive I improvement in that. Um, and you can kind of see here, we have some trending charts and such. And then if we kind of, kind of just zip down to here is the other chart that I wanted to show, um, you could see that you're hitting all your, all your bests. And so when we look at the five minute, um, you know, you're at, you're at 223 and your max for the year is 223. Uh, in the last 30 days, it's, you know, recently it's about 218, but then when we look more in, in the heart of the five minute, the four minute is really coming out very positive as well as the three minute. And you could see that these are your bests uh, on the four minute. Um, the other area that we've been working on a little bit is the sprint stuff you can see at 30 seconds. Um, and then just to, uh, the sustainability and the 20 minute stuff. So without ever doing a 20 minute test in the last 30 days, you're only about, uh, you know, 11, 11 watts off of your all time best for the year. Uh, so that that's a, a glimpse of what training shows and kind of what we're monitoring and how we can then assess what needs to be worked on more uh, to move forward uh, from there to make sure that we continually have what's called positive trend uh, so that you're, you're consistently improving. So yeah. yeah, small glimpse there for you. Yeah. And those, are, and what happens is those, those are what inform you to set up my block of training for a week or for a month or whatever. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. If we look at uh, kind of this right-hand chart here, 
Um, this yellow line is, is what we call your mean maximal power. Uh, and then this orange line is a mean maximal power of 30 days. So this, um, this, is, this yellow line is actually showing the last 90 days. Uh, and then this orange line is showing the last 30 days. And so we can look for gaps in here. So, you know, right around 20 seconds is a little bit of a gap. Maybe around 50 to 60 seconds is a little bit of a gap. Um, so we can kind of look at this and, you know, maybe this is the best example here of the, the two second mark. Uh, you have done about uh, 680, let's call it. And now you're at 600. Um, we would say, okay, well, maybe we need to work on two second power. Uh, why we have this now is because two second power is not really a priority to ride, you know, a couple thousand miles across the country. Yeah. So that's where these red bars where we've been working, we're showing improvement. And that's, you know, that's where the orange line here goes above the yellow line and that it will, will simulate a red bar um, in the calculation of the chart. So, uh, so that's kind of where we look at to make sure, okay, this is training specifically for Steve. Uh, and then also incorporating the goal that you want to train for to make sure that we're um, loading the workouts optimally at all times uh, to make sure that, yeah, we're ready. We're ready to go when it's, when it's game time. Yeah, that's the other thing that, that I found so interesting about this is it, it's, it's how you use the time training, not necessarily the total amount of training. <laughs> yeah, yes. And it's yeah. being very specific. And, and then for me, who's working full time, it's, it's making sure that the, the training can, that I can, I can do the training. I have a certain amount of time I can train and I, yep. and, and we can, and we can customize the training to maximize that time so that I can actually make progress. Yeah, ab absolutely. Yeah. Because remember training is, is workload and it's stress on the body. And so if it's not uh, a positive stimulus, like working on something, getting better at something, perfecting something, then it's just, you know, it's like your cell phone. Um, when you're not using it, the battery's getting lower and lower because maybe some background systems are running and then you go to use your cell phone and, and the battery's dead. Uh, so we, we don't want that with, with your, your body where when we need to train specific things, you're not rested and, and fully charged to do it. So the training has to be very specific in that manner to make sure that we're, we're, we're going after what we need to and, and really nothing else because uh, what's going to help you more is, is resting at that time instead of trying to just ride more or add in different types of training that are that are not going to be beneficial to to the end goal. Great. Well, just to, just to uh, summarize what we said so far, um, really training is about uh, sort of the uh, the three sided triangle. It's uh, training, it's nutrition, and it's uh, recovery. And, Absolutely. Uh, and that. Coaching is really about making sure that you are uh, able to be focused and maximize the uh, training time that you have for the best output for the specific goals you have in mind. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Pick a goal and then uh, work backwards systematically to figure out the, the model that you need to kind of put in play to achieve that goal. And that's where, um, you know, if, if that's, that's where expertise comes in, where you can have a, have a coach help you organize and, and develop that that system that model uh, because again looking at sports science we we look at an array of models with different athletes different types of athletes different sports and there's always common threads in all of that what works and what doesn't work you know where is the strength where is the aerobic endurance system where's the anaerobic ability or that that um, high speed ability uh, and that's and that's where you see in all sports I mean some people can jump really high and some athletes can't jump at all. And that's where they're kind of swayed into uh, the event that they can best accelerate in, you know? So if you, if you can't jump, I, I wouldn't try out for the basketball team. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so Mike, uh, will you close out the screen and then I'm going to ask you one kind of final question. There you go. Yeah, I got you. So then the final question is what's the craziest professional touring, uh, <laughs> story you can tell me in the audience <laughs> yeah yeah i mean I, I i've been i've been around and all over but uh usually one of the best is uh i was very fortunate to go with the u.s national team down to cuba uh at a time where americans could not travel to cuba and we got to do the tour of cuba which which is the same thing as the tour de france but but in the country of cuba and um it's a little bit shorter but uh when people go do the tour of cuba they say it's 
not the race that's hard. It's actually finding food and accommodations for you to recover. Uh, and you know, it was just, it, it kind of blew my mind. I, I was young. I was in my early twenties when I went there. Uh, and I, I've traveled around North America, but not, not, not to a place like Cuba and just to see the lifestyle and how people get by there. Um, we, we did this race and at the time I was sponsored by the same company as the current Tour de France champion. So I had the state of the art carbon fiber, very high end bicycle with all the best parts. And I was in this race and, um, it was, it was laps of this race and it had this hill in it and, uh, a Cuban athlete, uh, similar age and ability to me. Uh, and actually I should say much better ability than me in, in the end, um, was riding a bike from 1955, 56, something like that, you know? And so here I am, you know, steel bike, probably at least 10, 12 pounds heavier. Um, I think I had, you know, 20 gears on my bike. This guy had 10, uh, and, and um, it's, it's in, in the bike world, it's called indexing, but basically if you try to shift gears, you just press the button and it clicks into gear. This guy had what's called friction back then you used to, uh, adjust the, the lever and hold it in place and it would kind of grind and then you would adjust it again. And so it doesn't sound like a big thing, but when you're racing at, at 30 miles an hour and you're doing, you know, split second decisions, you don't really want to be fiddling with a hand off the handlebars adjusting this lever to to tune in your your gear so the chain doesn't drop off um and so that's that was how we started competing and then it just it got worse honestly for both of us uh after it was over because third or fourth time up this climb and we i think we had 20 laps or something like that you just heard like kind of like this ping pong you know kind of thing and uh we look back and the guy kind of just you know hits his head in frustration and his rear derailleur, which is holds the chain on and does all the shifting. It just imploded into, into like 20 different pieces and it was scattered all over the road and it was hitting the other cyclists and stuff. And so we came by the next lap and he was literally on the side of the road with a, with a rock, two rocks, and he was hammering the derailleur back together. And, you, you know, it was 20 seconds or something. So we kind of just shook our heads and said, man, this guy's got some determination um, but what was crazier is that a lap later he was back in the race. So with these rocks, he fixed this, you know, at the time, 60 year old or 50, 60 year old rear derailleur got back in the race and, and is still keeping up with us. Uh, and so two laps later and the thing broke again and <laughs> went, went all over the place. And now we said, okay, that's it, man. You know, call, call it a day, uh, where, I mean, yeah, not to sound elitist, but Usually when our break our when our bikes break, uh, the team car rolls up, gives us another brand new state of the art bike, and we go on our way. We're not trying to find rocks to fix fix our bike. Um, so it broke again, and uh, we come by the next lap. He's there fixing it again on the road, and and he actually ended up finishing finishing the stage. And uh, looking back at it now, some uh, twenty years later or something, it's. Maybe I should have quit then and handed this guy my bike and said, man, go, go win the Tour de France because yeah, you're a yeah. lot better, a yeah. better athlete than I am, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's that one that always sticks, sticks with me. Yeah. Great story. Yeah. 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 You never know. Right. <laughs> yeah. And, and being determined goes, goes a long way and, and, and making sure that, uh, you, you don't set limits. I mean, this guy had this old bike and he could have been frustrated and, and turned it into a massive negative, but just, he stayed driven and positive and, I don't, I don't know how I, that was a lot of determination, but, but kept after it. So it was Great really, story. really inspiring. Well, thanks very much. And thanks for being my coach. Uh, yeah. And uh, I, I look forward to more coaching from you because we're going to keep going for uh, a long while yet. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I appreciate it. And thanks very much for uh, bringing me onto this project. It's an honor and it's been an honor to work with you and then continue to work with you. So uh, keep up the good work and uh, really happy that we connected and, and went down this venture. I gotta get I gotta get through that sadistic 100. <laughs> yeah, that is, that is our nemesis at the moment, isn't it? I remember that story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I don't yeah. think I'll be pounding rocks on my bike though. <laughs> no, I, I hope that never comes to comes to pass. Yeah. So, All right. Okay. Well, great. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. <laughs>